take our hymnals is turned to 568 568 sing soldiers of Christ arise let's all stand to sing this together
save souls and you know that's your desire or I pray it be our desire to give this morning in Jesus name Amen. <laughs> joy to be here. It's good to see a good crowd here on a, on a holiday weekend. Good to see all of you children here. We love having you with us as well. So praise God that we can be here. There's a lot in your bulletin. Please look at it. There's a lot about VBS, especially on the back, the upcoming things that are happening. You know, I think on uh, there's a park, not park party, there is a community event. You need to look at that. All of the meetings that are involved and just pray because it's one month away. We'll be right in the middle of VBS one month from now, Lord willing. And so be praying about that. 
I did want to tell you something that I forgot to tell you last Sunday. Uh, uh, Fort Faith had 10 people saved the week before last. I'm looking forward to hearing what happened this week with their junior high and senior high camp. But that was great news. I'm so glad to hear that news. So, so I hope that uh, I hope you have a safe Fourth uh, of July, and uh, if you travel anywhere, that God will give you safety. But I'm glad you're here today. Amen. Good to have you, Pastor Wayne. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. Any birthdays last week? Or you got one coming up this coming week? Any birthdays coming up? Nobody's birthday. Any anniversaries? Show anniversaries amongst us this morning. <laughs> Kids are silly sometimes. You want any excuse to come up? I had a wedding anniversary. <laughs> I don't think so. I want you to come up though. I want you to come up and help me with the song this morning. We're doing I'm in the Lord's Army this morning. All right, come on up, kids. We're gonna do the chorus today. The Lord's Army. Come on up, kids. I need an army up here. Some marchers, some flyers, some people to ride some horses in the cavalry. We'll be in Luke 22 in a few minutes. Forgot to read this very nice note. Dear Camp Lake Baptist Church, it was a joy being with you last month. We hit the ground running here in Utah. <clears throat> we just did it five days of VBS. One young boy got saved. Praise the Lord. Thank you for the love offering you gave us while we were there. Your missionaries to Utah belongs. So that's wonderful. I'll make sure I read that in the morning service uh, and put it up on the bulletin board. <clears throat> thinking about what a blessing it is to be an American as we think about 4th of July and what is this the 246th anniversary of our country and uh, you know the turmoil that has been in our country yet what a great document our Constitution is I don't think we realize uh, it is one of the one of the greatest documents ever written. Of course, not above our Lord word. Nothing is above that. But when it comes to men's documents, uh, wow, the Constitution has been has proven itself over and over. I'm thankful for some constitutional originalists on the Supreme Court with what we've been seeing happening. So we praise God for that. I want you to keep praying. He didn't come today, but. Uh, Brianna said he'll be here next week. The young man, Joseph Jewell, who got saved a couple of weeks ago. Be praying for his scope, uh, spiritual growth, please. And we're so thankful for that. Uh, my daughter's family traveling, Jason and April and Lincoln, they are traveling this week. Uh, they're down in Kentucky, Tennessee uh, for the week, and they'll be coming back later. So I'd appreciate prayers for their traveling mercies. Also, Kara and the kids are out at her mom's in Pennsylvania. They'll be coming home sometime later this week. I know Tom sure misses them 
And uh, we were talking in Sunday uh, before Sunday school in our prayer time. Pastor Mark mentioned the safety of of the fireworks workers. <clears throat> His he has two working today with Mike and Lane. Of course, my son Tom works for Mike down at the state line, and so pray for uh, all of their safety. Um, I do want to mention Linda. Uh, keep praying for Linda and Burke, and we miss her. We know that. Uh, she needs our prayers. VBS, I mentioned it this morning, I mentioned it in prayer. We had a chance to see Edith Martin. That's Tim Brockham's mom. She's in uh, Mission Point. And uh, I, uh, I couldn't hear anything in there. It's funny because my hearing as it is, and then the lady that's in there is almost deaf, and she had that TV so loud that we're trying to talk, and it was really hard. Uh, Mary could hear what she was saying, but I sure couldn't. Pray for Sue Helms. Uh, we haven't seen her for a couple of weeks. Just keep her in prayer. Uh, Pastor Mark mentioned his dad is doing fine, but his brother Matt is having his own bout with kidney stones right now. So pray for Matt and Karen. All right, do you have any other prayer requests this morning that you might want to mention? Unspokens, of course. Let's see how many unspokens we have. There's about eight on that. All right, anyone else? Yes, TJ. I got a friend uh, from a new information class. He sent uh, a reach out yesterday. He was supposed to show up today. Oh. He'll stay to go see the Lord's church. All right. All right, we'll be praying for that. <coughs> I don't know how many of you saw this because 11 years ago, because Mary April was carrying Lincoln at the time, we went to the Battle Creek Air Show because Isaac was in a, got to fly in a, in the Fat Albert, which is the support plane for the Blue Angels when he was in the Marines. And so I happened to see on the news last night that uh, the driver of that jet truck, Shockwave, got killed yesterday. Mm -hmm. That that truck was going over 300 miles an hour and uh, something caused it to disintegrate. And of course, at that speed, the driver did not survive. So. Pray for that family this morning. Anyone else? All right. Father, thank you for the country that you have allowed us to be born into. Lord, I, I really believe you've blessed America uh, beyond uh, most what most people would see in a country. And because of the reason that many of the people that came to this land, they didn't come for gold, they came for God. They, they might have had some faults, of, of course, all of us do, but there were so many people looking for religious freedom and praying for your blessing. Lord, thank you for how you've blessed our land. Uh, Lord, as somebody once wrote and talked about, it wasn't the resources, it wasn't the land, and it wasn't uh, even the people that impressed them about our country, it was the churches. And that has really taken a hit in our nation we hear of so many people, churches, turning their back on the word of God. I just pray, Father, for a revival. We need a revival of church influence in our land. And I pray that it would start here with us. Lord, uh, I pray, Father, for these many requests that we've mentioned, uh, the people that were involved in this tragedy down there at Battle Creek. I pray, Father, for Matt, Pastor Mark's brother, who's having severe kidney stones right now. <clears throat> I pray for the safety <clears throat> of the firework, fireworks workers, Lord. Please protect them in volatile situation. I pray for the teen camp out. Pastor Mark mentioned that two unsaved kids are coming and maybe more. I pray, Father, that we might see some salvations when they have the camp out this later this week, please. And bless him and Kim with strength. And uh, Lord, just give them a great time with these kids. And I pray, Father, for these souls. Thank you for the report from our missionaries out there in Utah, the Longs, how that their, their VBS uh, resulted in a boy being saved. Thank you for that, Lord. What a blessing. I pray for our VBS, for the workers, for the safety, and for the salvation of souls. Now, Lord, bless those that are traveling. Bless our service today as we look at your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, yes, Carol. 
Esther and David. Oh, and yeah. They seem to be doing okay in the loss of the baby, but they both are fighting COVID. Oh, oh are they? And she said for her it's worse this time than the first time for her. Well, if you didn't hear, Esther and David, um, she lost the baby. And we mentioned that the other day in prayer time, Tuesday night. I was so sad to hear that. So thank you for that report about them having COVID. Pray for them. Esther and David Williams, let's be praying for them. Anyone else real quick? Um, Luke chapter 22. I, we left off about 31. And um, <clears throat> didn't I, I didn't really have time to say a lot about it, but previous verses <clears throat> talks about how the Lord told them that I'm going to appoint you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. There's a phrase in the Bible that says where, where we will reign with him for a thousand years. There is an aspect of we, I believe the church and the saved, um, Jew, the saved Old Testament saints will be extensions of Christ over the whole world. We will be sent to reign for him and with him. Um, we will have the mind of Christ. Uh, we won't have this kind of a body. Don't forget that. We will have glorified bodies. So we will have no lack of understanding. We will have the mind of Christ. We'll know what he wants, and we will be able to reign with him. And so um, there's some interesting things to think about there in relation to that. So he says that in the previous. He says, uh, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> Remember, there's 24 elder seats mentioned in the book of uh, um, uh, Revelation. And that kind of leads me with the idea, and I, I, I can't be dogmatic about speculation, but here he's talking about 12 tribes. I believe the apostles will occupy 12 of those seats, and maybe other great Christians will occupy the other in the church age who will also be involved in judging, not the 12 tribes of Israel, but maybe angels, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, judging the nations, however the Lord wants us to. 1 Corinthians 6 again mentions that, judging the world. I don't know exactly what that means. but So just realize that um, <clears throat> we will be reigning with Christ for all that that means. Uh, not gonna be, we're not going to have the big head or, or be power hungry like politicians are today who once they get in power and they realize they want to have a perpetual golden egg, uh, golden goose that lays a golden egg and, and it keeps them going in that regard rather than being servants to the nation. But that's not the way it's going to be in the perfect utopian society where Christ reigns. We're going to reign with him. And, uh, yes. Sir, at the end of that thousand years, the Great Rebellion. The Great Rebellion is after Satan is released, yeah. right? So that means it's unsafe. Remember that no one is born saved. Right. So thousand years, I believe the earth's population will explode like nothing we've ever seen. First of all, there won't be a curse on the ground. It will produce abundantly like, like the Garden of Eden rather than after the, cur after the sin. <clears throat> we know the curse will be removed because the lion will lay down with the lamb and, and the bear and the calf and all of that. But <clears throat> no one is born saved. People have to be saved by faith in every dispensation. The just shall live by faith. There will be an undercurrent of rebellion. They cannot openly rebel like we see in our world today because he rules with a rod of iron. But when Satan gets out of the bottomless pit, he is going to persuade them to go and to falsely hope, give them false hope that they can win. And that's the description of Revelation 20, where it says they will compass the saints. And I believe what it means is they will have, they will literally compass Jerusalem thinking they can beat Christ and God's just going to fire, rain fire from heaven. And uh, <clears throat> interesting little side note. There was a man who's done a lot of archaeological studies over there where um, Sodom and Gomorrah were. They pretty much found it. But he has found all of these balls of sulfur. Literally can light these on fire and they will burn and drip almost like a like somebody holding a marshmallow too long in the fire. 
but that is sulfur. So there's balls of sulfur all over the place. Uh, I think pretty good evidence that he rained fire and brimstone, and that's what brimstone is, sulfur, uh, on the earth and destroyed those cities. God's going to rain fire down, if you read it in Revelation 20, and destroy this uh, particular rebellion. And that's the end. That is the beginning of the end of all wickedness in this regard. The next thing that happens in chapter 20 is the great white throne judgment. The sea gives up the dead, which are in it. Every grave gives up the dead, the wicked dead. Hell gives up all the, the souls that are in it. See, that's why we say hell is not eternal. It's the lake of fire that's eternal. There is a resurrection of the damned, and they stand before God. There's no place they can go. And so um, that rebellion is the last rebellion. What does 1 Corinthians say? The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And uh, yeah, I think what it proves though, Brother Morris, is uh, man doesn't have the spark of divinity in him. Man doesn't have this innate goodness where if you make his environment good, he will just blossom and he will just show himself to be the good thing that he is. That's, that's a false teaching out there amongst sociologists, evolutionists who are trying to say we've gone from single-celled organisms, look at man, look at what we've, we are a product of evolution. We're just going to get better and better. No, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. <clears throat> Let's think about Satan here. Verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. That has always been an encouraging passage to my heart. But I have prayed for thee. Think about the prayers of Jesus. Go back and read John 17 sometime. That's the Lord's intercessory prayer. But here he tells him, I have prayed for thee. You know, Satan's desires aren't always Satan's. Satan doesn't get everything he wants. Isn't that great to know? Amen. I mean, he gets released. And he, he goes right at it. He has a season after that bottomless pit thousand year experience. Uh, he's going to go after it one more time. He knows what's in the Bible. He knows what's going to happen. He's still going to do it. But he has desires that are thwarted. He didn't get a hold of Saint, uh, Simon. He didn't get a hold of Peter and sift him as wheat, did he? <clears throat> he would like to. What would he like to do to you and I? He would love to tear us limb for limb. He would love to see us crying out in anguish and pain, hurting. He would love to see us burning in hell. That's what he wants for every person. But we need to realize there's a wonderful statement here. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That's an interesting thought, that thy faith fail not. You say, well, it failed. He denied the Lord three times. It still didn't. It didn't, didn't mean his faith failed. Uh, he had a lapse in judgment. He didn't do what was right. He sinned. We'll agree with all that. But he didn't lose his salvation. And maybe when he says, when thou art converted, maybe it means he didn't come to a point of, I, I just can't believe he's not saved at this point. Didn't he up on... Uh, you know, Caesarea Philippi, the place where the Lord says, well, who do you say that I am? And it was Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. So I don't believe that he wasn't saved, but maybe he means by converted here, uh, changed back to a right focus. I don't know. I don't know exactly what that phrase means, but it's made me wonder. <clears throat> we know they didn't understand till after the resurrection. Would you agree with that? We know they were dull of hearing. Even on this very night, they're, they're so dull and they're so weak that they sleep when Jesus needs them to pray. So, you know, we know that they're not all that they should be. None of them were. But God is in the business of helping them along. Look at the difference between this Peter, who boasted about that he would this or that, and the one that preached on Pentecost, 
What a difference. What marvelous things God did because of the resurrection. Let's read on. And he, meaning Peter, said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, that the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Now, that other passages make it clear that that really bothered Peter and he didn't like it and he, didn't, he disagreed with God. But uh, later we'll see what happens when he actually denies it's coming up. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, Lacked you anything? And they said, nothing. Remember when he sent him out, he said, don't take anything with you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I don't have this in my pocket, now it's not, I'm not money bags, okay? This is not full of, uh, of money because my wife is a garage sailor and any money that gets in here goes out, okay? It's just kidding. Um, it's not that. It's like your ID, your... Uh, Ability, you know, if you carry, you got to have your carry permit. If you, uh, the, you know, there's, I have now, I'm an old man and I have my, uh, uh, you know, I have my card from uh, Medicare in there. Uh, I don't know what a good it'll do me, but I have that now. I'm just saying, I, if I didn't have that, I would feel almost undressed, naked. I remember one time we went on a trip. Probably, Lee probably remembers this because. We went on a trip to see Tanya and Stephen and the kids when they were in Indianapolis. And we got about three to the fourths of the way down there. And we pull into some place. Mary wanted to get something to eat. And I said, I don't have my wallet. And I'm not driving all the way back. I remember, Lee, I asked you to come find it at our house and overnight it to me and all of that stuff. But I was driving without a license right then. And uh, just those kinds of things. He's asked them to go without anything. When you get out and get ready to go take a trip, you make preparation, don't you? You try to have some clothes to wear. Uh, if you take a flight, you try to have an overnight bag because they might stash your other things and they might get sent to the wrong airport. You got to have a little bit in case you have to spend the night somewhere that you weren't expecting. Now, those are just common sense preparations. He tells them to go without purse or nor script. Script would include food in a bag. They would sometimes carry a leather pouch, a bag, and they would keep some bread and some, some water in there and some food. And, uh, <clears throat> and he, then he said to them, but now, look at that in verse 36. But now he hath, that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Interesting. Interesting. Now, when they said about a sword in verse 38, two swords, he said, it is enough. Um, there's nothing in the Bible against self-defense. Um, aggressive actions are, can be either considered manslaughter or murder. Um, if the person's the aggressor, that's not what the Bible's talking about. Self-defense is one thing. And we'll see what he does here in a few minutes when Peter uh, tries to defend him. But he says, for I say, verse number um, 37, for I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. Interesting. Let's take this apart for a minute. Buy, sell your coat and buy some swords. But now, he's talking about for the short term, for now, um, <clears throat> It's kind of interesting because he knows that the Bible says smite the shepherd and the flock will be scattered. And he ensures that none of them are arrested. John is the one that stays with him, with him because he knows somebody in the uh, high priest um, place there. And so he's, he's kind of like insulated. Peter will follow afar off. The rest have run away. Um, if you read Mark's account, he describes a young man who they grabbed him and his coat came off and he ran away naked. It was, it was John Mark. It was Mark himself as a teenager was there that night. Um, <clears throat> so this is an interesting statement here. He says, let him sell his garment and buy one. You don't have a sword? Sell your garment and buy one. Then when they answer and say to him, 
Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. He knows what's about to happen. Interesting that Peter has one of those swords. Give me that, you know. He, Peter's the one that's got it. And so now let's talk as an interlude before the arrest. We'll see what happens when the arrest happens. Let's talk about Jesus' agony in the garden. By the way, anybody have any question or comment about these verses? Yes, sir. I think the swords represent the protection when they would travel. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't see any discussion of them, but I'm sure there were road bandits. Oh, yeah. Like that, 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 that was how they defended themselves. Yep. And and that's, I think the point of that is. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. And, you know, he tells the story of the, uh, the Good Samaritan who helped the man yeah. who had been beaten and robbed and left for dead. And, uh, you know, we have, we have to be alert when we're traveling away from our homes. You've got to kind of look around. You've got to know your surroundings. And I wouldn't stop and get gas in a, in a seedy place. Uh, make wise decisions on what you're doing because there are people waiting to prey on. Uh, I, I've had a person come up to me one time, caught me off guard. I mean, he was right in my face while I was pumping grass, gas and scared me to death. Um, look around, be, be prepared, be ready to make a hasty retreat if you have to. This is a dangerous world that we live in. If we go around our merry business thinking, oh, that'll never happen to me, that's a dangerous way to think, okay? You need to be prepared. That's kind of what he's saying, be prepared. It is enough. Don't forget that Gethsemane, what does it mean? Gethsemane, oil press. What is that region? It is a grove of olive trees down there on the side of the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives. A grove of olive trees. And it was called an olive press there, an oil press. A, pa a place where they used maybe stones, uh, kind of like what we would see in a grist mill. But they would put those olives in there and they would be crushed and the oil would come out. And so think of that pressure when you think of what the Lord is about to face in that place. So it's a it's an aptly named place, Gethsemane is. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And he, when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray ye, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We talk about this um, in relation to Christ's humanity. He is fully God and fully man. And so what does this mean? It means that he is going to feel all of the weight of this pressure and he is naturally responding to that agony by asking God, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Was, was he sinning? Of course not. Uh, if he would have refused to obey the Father, you could say he'd cross over into, he says, not my will, but thine be done. But he's saying, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Think about what that implication is. He's, you know, with God, all things are possible. But God chose not to answer that request or to answer that in his, the way of his request, but he said, not my will, but thine be done. And so the agony in the garden speaks of his humanity and his suffering. And it started there. It started right there. And so it says, Pastor, yes. it tells me for our salvation, there was no other way. Amen. And I believe you're exactly right. I do. Um, there was no way except for Christ's suffering and his sacrifice. And we hear of words sometimes we, we don't use them in our normal language. Vicarious. He suffered for us. He suffered in our place. He was sinless. And yet the Bible talks about the fact that 
he became sin for us. I, I don't quite understand how that was accomplished. But when he hung on the cross, the Bible says he bore my sin in his body on the tree. Yeah. Uh, I don't like the term, but my brother goes to a church in California where they call it Christ. They, they say after he's gone to the experience of the cross, they call him the processed Christ. Hmm. I don't like that term, but I understand the idea of it. In God, even by the fact that Christ becomes sin for us, mm -hmm. and the Father turns away. I mean, this is a, never had happened before, no. never happened again. He turned away from Christ on the cross. Oh, very unique event, yes. Yeah. And is there some change that takes place in God Himself because of Christ going to the cross? I would, I would have a trouble with that, with the word uh, immutable and unchangeable and yeah. things like that from Hebrews. Um, Jesus, we're going to see it in our passage today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, how, the, how Jesus is glorified after his resurrection. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is there something special that we don't even comprehend? We won't know till we get to glory on that. Yeah. But I don't think that we could say that materially or spiritually God changed. Yeah. I think what, what it is, is God's holiness demanded that the sacrifice take place and nothing as because he says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin it had to be holy blood so his blood and it's just like abraham's answer to isaac as they're walking up the hill here's the wood and here's the fire and he says god will provide himself a lamb i love how the king james says that yeah. god will provide himself a lamb and he is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world but it is, it, it bears um, our contemplation. Uh, it, it deserves our meditation. Things like this, like vicarious atonement. Um, just like this whole idea of the processed Christ. Now, I have read that somewhere, but I didn't know what kind of church is that your brother's at. That they call themselves the local church. Uh -huh. the development, you ever heard of Watchman D? Yeah. The normal Christian life. Mm -hmm. He had a fellow that was kind of his, that he mentored called Witness Lead. And it's a lot of it is almost Chinese uh, house church uh -huh. type of thing. But it's, they think there's only one church in every locality. And it's a little bit Baptist brighter similarity. Similar, yeah, similar, yeah. Similarity. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I think what we're going to find out when we get to glory, there's going to be some churches commended by God that we would probably have not. They would have been beneath us as, as good Bible-believing biblicists and Baptists. You know what I'm saying? I, I, God, just like he said when John and James said, they're not doing what's right. You want us to fire and bring fire down? You know, and there was a, sec, a, a sectarianism amongst the, the disciples where he said, they're not doing casting out like we are. And he said, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. In other words, he said, let them alone. They're doing a good thing. And we sometimes judge people before the day. We're going to be all judged one of these days. And uh, we're probably going to find out all of our shortcomings more so than to look around to see who the shortcomings are with everyone else. Our focus at the judgment seat will be with our own failure to Christ. And so... Um, I think there are going to be some uh, surprises when we get to glory in that regard. There's nothing um, going to surprise us that's unbiblical. What I mean by that is only faith will save people. That's not going to, we're not going to be surprised there. But some people will have faith that will surprise us that we didn't think or we didn't, you know, we didn't believe that they were accurate biblically or whatever. Um, but back to this idea of the agony, we got some time here to look at this. And, and so it says in 43, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. That's an interesting thought. We know that angels ministered to the Lord multiple times throughout his ministry, throughout his life. Um, but here, an angel, I don't know if that would be Michael or Gabriel, but an angel um, in particular, ministered to him and strengthening him and being in an agony and that that word agony i mean 
Have you, have you been in true agony? If you think about that now, anybody that's had a, a kidney stone, you would say, yeah, I have. Uh, we're talking about pain there. Uh, anybody that's bore a child, you know more so than we men. But this agony, I, I think, is deeper than anything we can really put our finger on. I remember the agony of my heart the night my granddad died without the Lord. I watched his face. I grabbed his hand. I could see the terror in his eyes. I loved that man. And I saw him die. And I, I had great agony for days, crying, unconsolable. And uh, I didn't care. I just went away from everybody. I just cried and cried and cried. I felt great agony. I remember my mom talking to him, Daddy, you got to get saved. <laughs> I'm no worse than that preacher. And he always said something like that and re rejected her uh, advances about salvation. It was so sad to see him die like that. That was probably the most agonizing I felt in relation to a thing that affected my heart. I remember the agony of seeing Tanya and Stephen hovered over that grave. That little grave. We sat in the car and we just wept because we didn't know what they were going through. We knew that they were hurting. You know what I mean by agony. But we have no idea what this agony was. Look at what it says. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I'm no doctor, but I have heard of people being under intense pressure that literally the, what do you call them, capillaries, the small veins near your pores burst. I've heard of that happening. I've heard of it happening with people that are under intense pressure. I've heard of their eyes getting very red and bloodshot. I've heard of people having strokes under conditions like that. All kinds of things can happen. Jesus sweat, as it were, drops of blood. When it says, as it were, I believe it was literally drops of blood, but it was mingled with his perspiration. It came out of his pores. He was already blood-stained before he even got arrested. Think about that. When I had my first kidney stone in 1980, and I didn't know what was going on, but I remember the instant flood of water to my mouth and I started vomiting. And I, I didn't know, I said, Mary, something's happening. And uh, there was a total head to toe, literally my pores opened up. I was soaking wet. I told her, I said, I gotta go to the hospital. I said, but I'm gonna jump in the shower before I go because everything I was wearing was soaking wet. <laughs> Literally, my body pores just opened up from that whatever thing was going on at that movement. It was just a little slight movement that time because it was a whole week later before it ever came and passed. But that's just from a little tiny thing moving in your body can cause all that. Imagine the weight of the world on Jesus Christ as he's kneeling there and praying and asking the Father, if it be possible, take this cup away. And he's doesn't answer him, does he? He says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And the angel ministers to him, and he's praying more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood. I just find that one of the most remarkable passages in the Bible. It's only recorded here in Luke. The, Luke is the beloved physician, as he's called, not the great physician, that's Jesus. The beloved physician, he would have a little more maybe a little more of a slant towards some description like this. And he was the only one that described the Lord as having great, great drops of blood, as it were, when he sweat. <laughs> great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And we know from the other passages that this happened twice. He came back and found him asleep twice. Um, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak is another phrase he says in the passage. And that's the case of our human condition. 
The Spirit is willing. We want to see God do things, but we are so weak, are we not? Every one of us. And while he yet spake, verse 47, and I, I'll go for a few more minutes here. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Now, to get the best picture, you, it's best to go and look at Matthew's account, Mark's account, Luke's, and John's. Because one thing you'll find out in John's account, because he presents Jesus as the Son of God, and remember the I am statements that I'm about to preach on for a series. He says in that event that night, because they're looking, whom seek ye? And they say, Christ. And he says, I am. And it's, a, it's apostrophized, it's, it's italicized in the King James, he. I am. He said, I am. And they fell back. They fell right back to the ground. Yet they still got up and arrested him. What that says to me is Jesus was telling them, you're really not taking me. I'm submitting to you because voluntarily you couldn't arrest me if I didn't lay you. And that's in essence. He says, no man taketh my life. I lay it down. But the kiss, the kiss of betrayal. Now we don't, I'm thankful that we, you know, Paul said, greet one another with a holy kiss. And uh, thankful that we're not in that culture, but we're not talking about the smack on the lips. They, you know, they kissed on each side of the cheek and it was, you see it happening today in greetings in the Middle East and so forth. But Judas, it says here, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. This was the sign. This, this is to say, this is the one. This is the one you want to arrest. <laughs> It's dark. It's a place of darkness. They've probably got torches, but you know, they don't give a whole lot of light. And uh, the, he's making sure that they don't arrest the wrong person, that Jesus doesn't somehow get away. And, uh, you know, from a human perspective, from their perspective, they, they don't want to mess up. Uh, this is, they've covenanted with him uh, to give him money, Judas. And, uh, if they mess up, you know, that would be bad in their eyes. So this is all being done in the cover of darkness. Don't forget, that makes it illegal. And Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? How ironic. Reminds me of that verse, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You've read that before back in Proverbs? Faithful are the wounds. Have you ever had to hurt somebody because you loved them? You know, give them some strong admonition, correction, and they took, they got a wounded spirit, they got hurt in their feelings. They think, how could you do that? You don't love me. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And this is an example of a kiss of an enemy. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. I mean, his, think if his aim was good, he probably would have killed the guy. You, you hit somebody with a sword at the top of the head, that's probably going to be fatal. But he missed, and he hit him, cut his ear off. That's gruesome. Here, Luke records something nobody else records as well. Notice. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. That's interesting that the people that are about to arrest Jesus, one of them gets his ear put back on and healed. You don't think he would have said, wait a minute, this guy must be the son of God. Let's, let's go. We don't need to arrest him. He's got power. No, he goes, he continues on. And later he's going to be involved again. You're going to see it. Um, by the way, do you remember what his name was? Malchus. 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 We had a little squirrel that came up to our feeder, bird feeder all the time, and I named it Malchus, because it had one ear. And uh, we had it a couple of years. I, I recognized Malchus, the same little squirrel he did. It was actually a big squirrel, a red a, a fox squirrel, one ear, named him Malchus. But here, and so it says, I lost my place, give me a second. Verse 52, then Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and elders which were come to, come to him, 
Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. We'll stop with that. I'm way over time. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They're going to get away with it under the cloak of darkness. They couldn't have gotten away with it in the daylight. The people wouldn't have allowed it. So that's an interesting thought in and of itself. The cover of darkness. Father, thank you that we could be here this morning. Please bless this service coming. Thank you for your precious word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.